welcome back. I've got some oddball jobs here. I'm still working on a couple of ridiculously huge projects, uh, which you will eventually see on video. They're taking up every available inch of the shop and every available inch of my brain. <laughs> um, you know, so the shop is a mess. My brain is a mess. You know, there are things that are stacking up that need to get done, like this beautiful Epiphone Les Paul bass. Kind of interesting. We don't see very many of these that often. The owner has some concerns about the switch. Namely, we expect it to go up and down. But when it also gives you the option to go to the side, turning it into a four-position toggle, that's very unusual and probably wrong. <laughs> um, he seems fairly handy, and he figured that he could work on it himself. But, you know, we just turn it over and discover that Somehow, this doesn't follow the usual anatomy of the species. There's no back entrance. You can't access the switch this way. A brief history. Gibson first started making less Paul-shaped bases in the late 60s, as part of that series where they got less to exercise his low impedance ambitions, and he got pretty far out with it using various switching and phase options, etc. They went through a number of changes, uh, lasted until the end of the 1970s, but they were never big sellers. In the 90s, Gibson revisited the idea and basically just put a long neck on the familiar Les Paul standard shape, which is what this Epiphone is inspired by. They also made some flat top versions, but you'll note that they did put an access panel in there for the switch. It was at this point that he learned how difficult it can be to deal with this situation. I don't know why Epiphone does this, Maybe they save a little bit of time not routing out and installing the access panel. But yeah, if the switch stops working, we have to start fishing. And there's a bit of a, a run from here to here, and it's a tight, tight fit. So let's plug it in first and see what's going on. Okay, we're very buzzy. Turn it up to 10 here. Eh, it's kind of lackluster. A little bit more out of the bridge pickup. Yeah, it seems like the neck pickup is always at least partially involved. So, bad switch. Had a quick look inside. Ugh, bunch of hair. I'm not sure about this wiring. It looks like someone has been in here. I don't know, I think this front pickup ring might be mounted backwards. I don't have much of a problem with it because the top of the pickup is pretty much level with the other. But we'll see what happens when we pull it out. Mm-hmm. Okay. It's actually not too bad. The relief route in here is pretty substantial. We'll remove the switch tip, first of all. And uh, I can remove that ring by hand. And the poker chip. Now, hopefully, there's enough space for this to go right down and inside. Or not. <laughs> Well, you would expect there'd be a way to angle this so that by pulling on the harness it would come through, but it feels as though the switch body is about the same depth as the cavity it's going into, and there's no way it's ever going to be, like it won't just drop down and in. Um, doesn't matter which way I angle it. Always winds up the same. Got out the bore scope so you can see what we're dealing with here. How the switch is exactly the depth of the interior. Somewhere in Korea an electronics installer is laughing at me. Hey, it's been about 15 minutes and I'm starting to get angry. Come on. Yay. <laughs> oh, 
that's insane. Yeah, that's um, there's a whole lot of play in this. The little axle which uh, the switch tip runs on has broken or has come loose. I can see that it's not separating the leaves of the connection every time I flip it. So that's always on. And uh, we'll get rid of it and put a new one in. Got to make sure it's the switch of the same dimensions, obviously. Though looking at it end on, the new one is marginally wider. Specifically the screws. So um, I don't think that's going to be an issue. Someone might ask if you could use one of the Gibson low profile switches. And I suppose you could, but because they're quite long, uh, there's only one way it would fit in the channel that runs between here and the pickup cavity. So you'd end up with very weird, uh, non-standard positions for the switches. You know, you'd be kind of running sideways. And, uh, you know, if someone didn't know, they might try and jam it down in the usual way and we'd end up with the same problem we've had now. The solder sucker can be useful because sometimes you need every last millimeter of length because they don't give you any extra for the wiring. In other words, I don't want to just cut the wires off short. I'll detach all the wires after having taken a photograph to remind myself from whence they came. I'll reconnect to the new switch. The grounding lug can require a bit more heat because it's a pretty thick piece of metal. A 25 watt iron might be too weak to do the job, so I got my big ugly 40 watt here. It's pretty important to use a piece of heat shrink tubing on the outside connections because they're very close together and might get squashed against each other during the wrestling process to come. A little miniature butane heat gun. Okay, bit of a mystery now. Lots from the bridge pickup. Not a whole lot from the neck. If I switch to one side, still lots of bridge pickup. If I switch to the other side, still lots of bridge pickup. So I gotta look at the wiring again. Well that would be the reason. It seems like all of the switch wires have been tied off, not connected into the circuit. Um, I guess when the switch got damaged, someone just decided to run it off of the bridge pickup and leave everything else alone. So this is 1950s style Les Paul wiring, where the tone capacitor um, connects to the middle lug, as does the input from the pickup. Um, this means I gotta unwire a bunch of stuff and wire the switch back in. This is a lot. Working inside a cavity like this can get pretty annoying. Especially when it's stuffed full of wires. It can feel like you're working in a mine shaft when you're making connections. And you have to bend things out of the way and make sure you're not inadvertently burning stuff. Amazingly, after all that, I still end up with virtually nothing coming out of the neck pickup. It's very weak, so I grabbed my multimeter. So the neck pickup's reading 8.4k ohms. And the bridge pickup, similar. So those seem to be functioning. This suggests there's a problem either in the pots or the wiring. And looking at the spaghetti, there's so much stuff in here I don't trust. There's like dual lead cable being used for the grounds with bits sticking out. I have to pull it out and start over because it'll likely take longer and be more expensive for me to try and diagnose it in situ. It's really dirty. I have mismatched screws holding the jack on. Oh, yeah. Tasty. Where the hell was this thing stored? Like, it seems to have been filled with sand. Or perhaps cat litter? 
Okay, before wiring everything back up together, it's a good idea just to test the pots to make sure. Sometimes if there's a bunch of solder that runs down inside them, stuff can ground out. This is my multimeter set on ohms. I can bridge both sides of the pot, one on either side here, and I end up with uh, 468k ohms, which uh, for a 500k pot, this being an alpha pot, that's kind of reasonable. However, when I go to the next volume pot, I get nothing. Not good. So, that's probably our culprit right there. I'm going to replace it and test the new one. And it's a hot pot, 515k ohms. That's fine. So, this guy's no good. There's a bunch of garbage solder on the back, but looking at the lugs, it's hard to tell. Maybe too much heat was put on it. Maybe some ran down inside. We won't know. Let's use the solder sucker again to get rid of the old solder in the eyelets of the pot lugs. It's hard to get clean connections with it in the way, because sometimes there's more than one wire that needs to go through them. In this case, I'll use the Gibson-style ground wire, which is stiff and solid, keeps the pots from ever spinning, and it's neat. One area comes close to a pot lug where there'll be some connections, so I'll put some shrink tubing on it just to be safe. I've got an alligator clip on the leg of the capacitor as a heat sink to keep it from overheating. No, it's not boutique wiring, but it's strong and it's functional. Oh, back to the task that started this whole thing. I'm going to use some dental floss, which I threaded through the channel, because it's good and strong and I can really tug on it. I'll tie that to the switch arm. This is still no mean feat, because there isn't enough room for it to happen gracefully. So I'll pull until I can see the switch, and then use various implements to coax it into position and finally pull it up. The thing is, it takes more force than you'd want to use because you're levering it against the side walls of the hole. It's the only way it'll come up. I thought about routing an access panel at certain points, but I'm trying to keep the cost reasonable because it is an Epiphone. Hooray! Get that snugged up. And we'll put the switch tip on. Doing some intonation work. Interesting bridges on these. They're sort of like the mid-70s ripper and grabber bases in some of the SGs I've seen. It's almost like the bridge pickup on a Telecaster because it has three screws. So you can adjust the height, but you can also adjust the tilt. The saddles themselves are non-adjustable in terms of height, so it's kind of like an ABR bridge with one more axis. Continuing with the usual setup, there's a little more relief than I'd like to see. It seems around 13 thousandths here. I'll snug up the truss rod a little bit. And we come to the conclusion. This is another cautionary tale when it comes to buying used gear with electronics issues. Because it's just a switch. No, wait, it's not hooked up. Oh, wait, the wiring is wrong. No, wait, a pod is malfunctioning. It can end up being a staircase of problems with each step revealing a new challenge. It becomes a rich tapestry.